All right, Ethan. Today I'd like <laughs> today I'd like to talk about supersets as topic one. I have multiple sets in the bank, as you know, as always. Um well, hopefully you couldn't even tell me 10 seconds before <laughs> like, <laughs> trying to get a coffee. I'm like, what are we talking about? You're like, you'll find out. <laughs> Again, I, I just think it's a good um I think it's good for people to know to know that this is completely off the cuff and uh and organic. Um so any anyway, I always like to start out with like current trends and like what it, what people are talking about in relationship to these kinds of things because um I I think that's a helpful starting point for like what are the things that are people are currently uh being convinced of for good or bad reasons uh and how can we sort of maybe you know put a reframe on some of these things because you know, supersets much like with, um, you know, the long length partials thing is similarly, um, it's, it's a hot topic of discussion. So it's similarly popular, but it's almost, almost popular in the opposite direction as the long length partials, which is that like, people seem to believe that supersets are like super bad for gains. And if you superset, regardless of the arrangement of the superset like you're losing gains you're losing output and you're losing motor unit recruitment and you're losing muscle mass as a consequence um so 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 i'll just i'll say i'll summarize that obviously not everyone thinks that but that seems to be the the place that we can start with as as the current trend which is like supersets much like shorter rest periods is kind of a similar thing i think in people's heads supersets equals less gains so for starters i think it's good to maybe outline too that there's not like one kind of superset so you know we can talk about maybe about um supersets that are sort of same uh, muscle group supersets and then supersets that are opposing or close to opposing uh muscle group supersets um but where i wanted to start just with all that in mind, just sort of do whatever you want with with that in terms of how we go about talking about this. But when I first met you back in, I guess it was 2020, which it feels like a lot longer ago than that, um, you you were for a vast majority of like upper body stuff, um, at least as far as I remember, doing a lot of like supersets and like opposite muscle group supersets. So, you know, you go over to uh, do a press, like, you know, a horizontal press, and then you go over and do a vertical pull and you'd have, you know, two or three minutes in between each of those. And you just sort of bounce back and forth. Uh, and now that's not something that, you know, you are currently doing, uh, but you are doing, you know, some, some other stuff. So rather than to just talk about the specific use cases that, um, you apply, in terms of your training then and your training now, I want to, I want to get there eventually of like, okay, why this transition? But just for starters, um, when, when supersets come to mind for you and when some of this information comes up insofar as the assumptions about them, et cetera, um, where does your head go first in terms of like, where do supersets fit into a program? Um, you know, for, we'll call it hypertrophy, pure hypertrophy, uh, uh, training. First, just want to clarify, if it looks like I shit myself at the beginning of this podcast, it's because the uh, the cat, for whatever reason, when she hears your voice, just like jumps up onto the chair with me for the podcast. <laughs> you always see the tail going by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she loves me. I feel like your cats do like me a lot. And I, I, am, I am a dog guy, but, you know, he's not, uh, he's not a lap dog, so we don't see him so much for this podcast. No, he's too big. Yeah. She just jumped on me with her, like her nails fully exposed, uh, <laughs> like you know, latched onto my leg. Oh, I didn't uh, even notice because I was. I think what I, that was partly when I was talking. I was like looking elsewhere, so that'll be funny to uh, to rewind. I, you know, I wake up with these like gashes on my body, and I'm like, "What is this cat doing to me?" In the middle of the night? Yeah, yeah. Um, but the question was, um, what was the question, Ben? Because I know I know you had mentioned about supersets in terms of like I was doing that earlier on, but mm -hmm. then pivoted to like maybe a more general question from there. Yeah. So maybe a better question to start off with would be um 
you've arrived at the point where you are putting a superset in a program. How did you arrive at that point? Like work backwards from there. What problem does a superset solve? And uh, what problem does the superset maybe create to, to, to give, you know, because all these kinds of things, like I mentioned, the long length partials thing, people are into it for a good reason. It's like, hey, this thing showed this outcome, at least at a very surface level. Uh, therefore, it's something that we should try. And, you know, to the to the um, on the flip side of that, if something maybe in research or as a trend is saying, you know, hey, these may uh, not allow you to achieve X, Y, Z outcomes, at least in the same magnitude or to the same degree, it would make sense to maybe experiment with not using as much of them. But I think that's maybe a, a good starting place, which is you've arrived at the point where, you know, you are creating this um, superset arrangement between, let's say, a horizontal press and a vertical uh, pole or a horizontal pole or something like that. How did you arrive at that point and what, and what function is, was that serving and what problem were you solving having done that? Yeah. I mean, really the only issue, um, it is just time efficiency. Um, so it's always like, if you can do more with less, you know, why wouldn't you? And, um, I guess there are some, you know, exceptions where like, you know, I, I was training a client yesterday and um, I realized that, you know, while the outcome I'm looking for is like creating an adaptation with the least amount of possible fatigue for some people like training, you know, in an emotive sort of way, you always use that word like arousal on this podcast, but like, you know, training with a high amount of arousal is really like the thing that is you know most exciting you know about the bodybuilding process that's like um and, and certainly i can relate to that like you know early you know in my training career like i think it was very cathartic like it is something that you do get a pretty strong um you know like chemical response to and it makes you feel really good so i realized that like in reality for a lot of people like making the most progress with the least amount of, you know, ancillary costs is not actually the goal. You know, most people really aren't being objective and saying like, I just like, all I'm concerned about at the end of the day is, you know, driving progress in the vector of say hypertrophy, fat loss, et cetera. Even at the highest level, like there's some psychological bias in there in terms of just like, what we want to get in terms of a feeling out of training. So some people that feeling might be, you know, their heart rate's high, they're sweating a lot. For other people, that might be how much load they put on the bar or just how psyched up, you know, they can get, you know, just the feeling they get at the end of the set, at the end of the workout with other people watching them, but them filming themselves, whatever, like that. We have to acknowledge that that is a big driver for a lot of people behind training. Mm -hmm. If we separate that for a second and, and we look at like, what are some of the, you know, drivers of fatigue on just sort of like a chronic level in regards to training, I don't think we can disregard just the amount of time you spend in the gym. And that shows up, you know, on a day to day level, which at a certain point, like when you're and again, this will only apply to a small subset of people, but when you have to eat, you know, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 calories of food, you know, you actually have to like budget your time pretty carefully during the day. And if being in the gym for three, four hours, having, you know, an hour of prep beforehand, driving back afterwards, like you can actually find yourself in a position where your time becomes pretty condensed and it may roll over into the amount of sleep you get. It may roll over into the amount of meals you can eat. It may roll over into your family and leisure time. It may roll over into how many hours you can work and thus how much money you can make. So I think we're always kind of like, you know, budgeting uh, our time and energy. And I think that is maybe one of the most, you know, overlooked things in this whole process is uh, really just being able to lay out, you know, a, a, a weekly, you know, daily schedule that allows you to be sort of most stable, uh, most consistent, and, you know, just in a place where, um, you know, recovery is sort of fully optimized, so to speak. 
And a lot of times <clears throat> that revolves around things outside of the gym, like I said. So, you know, I was actually just walking the dog, talking to one of my friends about, you know, whether he should train five days a week or four days, you know, a week. What's, you know, the optimal split? I'm like, look at the the end of the day. Um, right now, you know, I'm, I'm training four hours or training four days a week. And I end up training for, you know, around 10 hours a week. If someone told you they're training four days a week, you're like, man, that guy like doesn't really train that much. But if someone told you, oh, they're training five days a week, two hours a day, you'd be like, that's, that's a pretty good amount of training. Or if someone said like, you know, I train every single day for an hour and a half, again, you'd be like, man, that guy's probably overtraining, you know, when mm -hmm. it's all kind of the same thing. And then we got into this concept of like, you know, a training schedule that's way, laid out on kind of a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday type schedule, like a weekly schedule versus sort of a day one, day two, day three kind of revolving schedule. And just the main concept, as I just kind of like go on a tangent here, is really that like the outside world matters. You know, when you're on a weekly schedule, it allows you to plan for on the weekends, I do this, you know, I plan my, you know, cardio or, you know, people do, you know, soft tissue work or they schedule meetings. Like, I think the idea of, you know, having consistency, having time to, uh, you know, leisure time outside of the gym, like just the, all the things involved with like self-regulation you know, over the course of the week are more valuable than the actual training time itself. Like you got to get that in, in some, you know, sort of organized way, but I think you should set that up so that, you know, your weekly structure allows you to, you know, sort of best self-regulate. So going way back, you know, from this tangent, you know, the whole point was just that like reducing the amount of time you're in the gym, I think matters if you do actually want to, you know, reduce, um, you know, the overall fatigue associated with what it takes, you know, to, to build a lot of muscle, be a high level bodybuilder, et cetera. Um, so I, I really think that's like the primary thing driving this decision for supersets. And then from there, we kind of break into like, well, what are the most viable ways to reduce the amount of time we're in the gym? And um, I think the core question in all of this in regards to like, you know, are we getting less stimulus by reducing rest periods? Are we getting, you know, uh, reducing rest periods could be, you know, resting one minute instead of three minutes, reducing rest periods could be drop sets, rest pause, could be supersets. Like these are all just ways of organizing your training. So you're in the gym for less time. And then the trade-off is, am I getting less stimulus for being in the gym less time? Because if you could be in the gym less time and get the same amount of stimulus, again, if the main outcome isn't just a, a psychological one, I do think that's a wise decision, you know, from a, a fatigue standpoint. So I think the core concept just comes down to like a lot of times um, there are ways in which you can reduce the rest periods through this various methods, which may result in lower output in terms of the weight moved. And does that matter? You know, if I do a, um, you know, if I rest one minute in between sets of leg extensions instead of three minutes and I get, you know, 30 reps across all sets versus 33, does that mean that I got less stimulus or, you know, does getting more reps across the set just linearly equate to more growth um, from, you know, talking directly to researchers like Brad Schoenfeld, for example, I don't uh, believe at this time we have strong evidence to support the idea that um, just by moving more load, doing more reps that automatically equates to more growth. I think we see this play out when the growth is not really different uh, between like full rest and things like, you know, drop sets, rest pause, you know, in isolation exercises. Um, I think we play see this play out in exercise order, you know, when you look at say leg extension before leg press versus leg press before leg extension, you can certainly do a lot more weight, you know, and you get a lot more sort of like tonnage by doing leg press first, but we don't see that this makes a difference in regards to hypertrophy. So my current, um, 
you know, my current understanding of this and then the way that I lean right now is focusing on reducing the fatigue side of things, whether that be orthopedic fatigue, whether that be just total time spent in the gym, whether that be, you know, the sort of emotional fatigue of getting, you know, ramped up for sets. My focus is uh, for the person, again, who's trying to really maximize a level of hypertrophy. And it's not purely about just like, I am doing this, you know, as a leisurely activity that I just have fun moving the most weight and getting hyped up. Um, you know, maybe like uh, Sam Sullock, you know, would be a good example of that, right? Like, obviously the shit works. Is he trying to be Mr. Olympia? That's not my understanding. Um, so, you know, if you are trying, you know, to maximally, you know, mitigate fatigue and get the most stimulus, um, I think it is viable to look at, like, how could we potentially, like, use less loads? How could we potentially be in the gym less time? How could we, um, you know, potentially drive the least amount of fatigue uh, in the shortest amount of time and, and still get the same stimulus that we would uh, with the inverse? Yeah, so one of the themes that I'm picking up there is that the fatigue equation as it relates to outcomes is not as simple as should you should you rest longer or shorter because part of what leads to outcome um over pr part of what leads to appropriate outcomes or desired outcomes long term is the ability to sustain whatever you're doing, you know, for a long period of time. And if you are running into roadblocks where you can't sustain what you're doing, um, even if it's in the short term, it seems like that kind of blockage of a specific runway leads to much longer term, you know, slower progress. So I think that's an interesting framing, meaning that like, much in the same way that you might put the leg extension before the leg press, you might include a superset for the specific purpose of overall looking at fatigue as like this amalgamation of the to use your word amalgamation of things rather than um just this isolated variable that occurs on uh you know this one day of the week within this one single session within this uh one single micro cycle or whatever it happens to be um so i think just for context that's a really good way to frame this issue or not this issue this topic just as something that influences more than just the acute variable of what is the weight on the stack. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that like Sam, for example, is not trying to be Mr. Olympia. I actually think that 99.9% .9 of people are not trying to be Mr. Olympia. And yet a lot of times the way that people look at these things is it comes from the perspective of someone who you would think is trying to be Mr. Olympia, right? Like, uh, uh, does that make sense in terms of like the, the, the discrepancy between someone's actual goals and then how much they think that these specific variables matter, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's almost like there's this, which is kind of funny because when you're talking to someone like yourself, who's, you know, that's, uh, a, a potential, you know, like a realistic, a potential aim, uh, you're not the person who is actually, focusing so much on the micro that you're unable to see the the greater picture of like what fatigue is and how fatigue sort of is influenced by a lot of different things rather than just the acute weight on the bar or the time that you're resting altogether. So I think that's interesting is the more specific that you get, ironically, uh, the more that you're sort of forced uh, backward uh, because the more that you're literally driven in specific directions as a consequence of fatigue. But as we've discussed before, I think the overall fatigue concept is uh, not like the biggest issue for a lot of people. It just in terms of, you know, it's not like people are, it's not like most people are overtraining and thus they need to add supersets to decrease rest time, to decrease total time in the gym. But in terms of your specific use case and your application, you're saying that that's something that for you has been helpful in the overall mitigation of global fatigue over time. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. And that's kind of why we, you know, started this podcast with like doing the consultation type of format, which kind of ended up being more yeah. of like one-on-one -on -one Q and A was just to look at like, what are the actual problems, you know, people are having, not like, you know, how am I going about solving this, you know, in, in my own programming, 
because the answers many times are the opposite, you know, of what I do for myself. You know, like I said, the person I was just talking to before this, you know, I explained how I log book in a way where I don't see the, um, you know, the, the reps that I got from the previous week. And I just trained to failure, focus on doing, you know, perfect execution for each rep. I let the outcome be what the outcome is. And then I reflect back on that, you know, uh, historically, you know, but I know the person that I'm talking to, I know how they train. I know the exercises they use. I know the ability they have as far as like um, using proper setup, proper execution, you know, and being able to sort of like uh, maintain uh, those positions uh, as they fatigue, the, you know, bias they have in terms of like, uh, the type of exercises they're going to use and how you know amped up they're going to get to do it and I'm like you absolutely should not use that paradigm and train to failure in every set because you'll be injured you know in a matter of weeks like it takes a lot of prerequisites for that to be the answer to the problem and most people to your point are not in that position so they're solving for a different thing and most of the time, again, like the way these consults usually work out is just getting to the bottom of what is the actual problem the person is solving for? And it's almost never what they say it is. <laughs> yeah, it's not always easy to identify when you don't have a lot, when you don't have the sort of scope, you know, because a lot of times, like I've noticed with you in particular, that when you're helping people, you're kind of able to, and this is how all things work, but you're able to identify um, problems fairly quickly as a consequence of just sort of seeing broad patterns everywhere because you yourself have experienced and gone through a lot of problems as uh, pretty much every problem imaginable as it relates to this whole journey. And so you kind of know which problems at which stages are kind of like the things that are getting in the way, so to speak, whether it be, you know, diet related or, or training related. And I, what I've noticed in you is that you're usually able to get people to identify where they're going wrong, but that's not always, um, it's, 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 it's almost never the fun, the fun thing to hear because you're like, oh, I was really excited about potentially using this new thing, this new fresh thing, this new strategy to solve this problem. But in, in reality, it's actually not like the part, you know, that I need to, to fix the car or whatever, um, which can be disappointing because I think a lot of these things are simply just interesting and exciting. And, uh, you know, if they're novel, novelty is, is a huge thing, which I think has its own merits in it, in and of itself. Um, but just to sort of, um, backtrack or, or to get back on track here, I think that, um, another thing that is not often discussed in the context of, um, supersets is just convenience, right? Like oftentimes, um, and we see this at our gym a lot when people are doing supersets, it's like, uh, there's the consideration of other other people who are using the same pieces that you're going in and out of. There's the consideration of just how much space in general, are you pulling a bench up next to something to do something? Um, you know, are you, are you, um, are you taking up half of the space in the back because you're doing three different things? Um, which in a commercial setting is, you know, usually not particularly, um, practical anyway. So if there's an argument, you know, potentially against the, uh, the superset or not against it, but just as, you know, a trade-off, it's like, it can be pretty inconvenient both to set up uh, and uh, also to other people who are, you know, around you. That's not something that, you know, people have to consider who are training at like smaller facilities a lot of the time, because a lot of people aren't super crowded, um, you know, if they're private, but oftentimes it's not the case. So uh, from a practical standpoint, though, um, the upsides, like we were saying, are just um, reduce, you know, potentially reduce time because, you know, you could obviously just take more rest between the supersets and end up sort of time equating. Right. But that's, we're assuming that that's not, you know, the case where, you know, you're, 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 uh, equating for the amount of time that it would have taken, uh, to, to do two separate things, one after the other, and you're reducing the time in between those things so that you're just sort of going back and forth and that you're actually cutting down time. But I think that the interesting point here 
and the point that's most discussed as a negative of the superset, which we're saying may or may not be actually of influence, is like load reduction and then potentially just total uh, work reduction. So let's say you know, you're doing a hundred pounds on each of these things individually, each for 10 reps. Maybe when you do the supersets, you can do 90 pounds instead uh, for maybe the same amount or or one or, or two fewer reps per set. And we're saying that if you effort equate between those things, there doesn't seem to be a huge difference in outcome. Would you say that's accurate? So when it comes to the supersets, you were mentioning me doing at the beginning, as far yeah. as pull, you know, some type of pressing movement, some type of pulling movement, bench press, you know, dumbbell row. Um, what we actually see oftentimes is the opposite, that the output actually goes up. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah. So for whatever reason, that's not, you know, fully been elucidated. Uh, we either see the same or sometimes more output when you're supersetting like a, you know, push pull type of movement. I think the caveat to that is like the the whole theme I think with stimulus is just like what is being fatigued. I think it's always comes back to the concept of like what's the limiter. So, you know, if you do for example like a bent over barbell row, you get done and you know your heart rate's 150 and you know you're kind of like you know gasping or the chest supported row and you couldn't breathe while you were doing it then you immediately, you know, run over, uh, you know, to a chest press that may limit your output just in terms of your respiratory rate, your heart rate, you know, your grip, whatever, there could be other things that limit it. So you need to allow enough rest for those things to recover. Um, but, you know, let's just take that first example of your training sort of non-competing areas you're not using a, a redundant approach where you're training the same you know muscle back to back um in those cases i don't think we generally see a reduction in performance unless the limiter is something you know sort of cardiorespiratory in nature so that's important to consider that that's not actually the case in many situations um and that carries over to not just you know sort of broadly the push pull but Oftentimes you're doing, you know, two isolation exercises that, you know, are, don't have any redundancy either. Like, you know, when I'm training with you, I'll often do like calves and triceps together. Um, and that's just out of, you know, convenience. The day that we train together is, you know, hamstrings, calves, triceps, middle delts with a, you know, a little bit of tibialis and forearm stuff. So, you know, I'll hit tibialis and then go do a set of lateral raises or I'll hit the <laughs> forearm stuff and then, you know, go do lateral raises with the wrist cuffs on. Um, so anywhere where I can find something uh, that doesn't make uh, another area the limiter in terms of what I'm trying to train. So for in this example, if I'm trying to train my middle delts, and I haven't trained something else beforehand that doesn't allow the middle doubts to be the reason why I'm fatigued. So for example, if I did something where grip was a limitation and then I went and held, you know, a dumbbell in my hand and did lateral raises. And the reason why I couldn't do the lateral raises was because of my grip, then, you know, I don't think that would be a good use of supersets, but I can actually do, you know, intensive forearm work and then go do my lateral raises because i have the wrist cuffs on and it doesn't seem to make any difference in output and it's pretty easy you know to test that just in terms of the reps you're getting so in most instances you know in reality i don't get a decrease you know in output from the supersets that i do i just you know pick whatever is convenient you know the other gym i train at is three floors so sometimes it's just like it has to be on the same floor as to your point before and has to be on equipment that people aren't using often. So, you know, as a first concept, like if you have the ability to do supersets where it's practical and it doesn't reduce uh, the output that you're getting, I can't see a good reason not to do that. Uh, you know, as long as, like I said, it's practical. And then, you know, from there, it's moving on to the concept of, well, what if it does reduce your output? Then I think the first consideration is why does it reduce your output? Is it reducing your output, like I mentioned, because of some other factor in terms of, you know, neurological, cardiovascular, respiratory, you know, fatigue? Um, then I don't think that's a good decision. 
but there may be some instances where like the order of exercises you choose um, or the superset, because really like this is all just sort of condensing rest in between things. And it's all just like what's getting fatigued first. So if I go and do a set of flies before I do a set of presses, like whether I superset that fly and press or whether I do all my sets of flies first and then go do all my sets of presses, the concept's still the same. I've fatigued the same muscles that I'm going to use either five minutes later or a minute later. Um, so I think you're still looking again, all these concepts just kind of come down to what's the limiter. And if my goal that day is to train my packs and I fatigue them on a set of flies, and then I go and do a set of presses, my output will be less in terms of load or reps that I can use for the presses. But the thing that will fail if the press is set up to train my pecs will still be my pecs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, might that mean that my triceps or front delts like don't get fatigued? It, it might mean that. But if my goal is to get the most out of my pecs, I might use that strategically to then limit the amount of uh, strain put through, for example, like the elbows, you know, or shoulder joint. Right. So I think that's a really good use case sometimes is to actually, whether it be a superset or whether it be the order, I think it's basically the same thing is just like you're fatiguing what you want to be fatigued and then you go and fatigue it again on something else. And yeah, of course you can do less, but that's actually no different than if I do a set of 10 to failure on the, the same exercise on the next set, I also do less. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so no matter what, like you're going to do less with time. Like, what do you want to fatigue? Yeah, right. And, and you know, at a certain point, you could just you could just rest long enough so that for every single set, you were using the same amount of load for the same amount of reps, you yeah. know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like how long, you know, would it really take, right? Even on like uh, an isolation exercise. Yeah, I mean, like how many, how many, how long would you have to wait realistically to do like the the rich piana eight arm eight hour arm workout um where you're still training eight hours later it's like you either you either have to use no load or you just have to rest so long that a majority of the eight hours you know is is rest and not and not actual work to be able to you know maintain your performance yeah yeah or you could just keep switching exercises and you wouldn't really know you know that's a lot of what this is is you just don't see it because of how it's being measured right like i said so for example if you use reps in reserve you you might not notice that the performance is going down right because you may be able to maintain the amount of reps you get and it's just it's sort of a, a decreasing reps in reserve or to your point you switch exercises but you keep the same order of the exercise all the time like no matter what you're going to incur fatigue and you're going to get you know less output but that's that's how you get the stimulus in the first place yeah you know? and i don't think the solution is just to um spread out the frequency more and more i don't think the solution is every hour just do one set you know all week kind of like that like greasing the groove you know pull up kind of thing like mm -hmm. maybe some instances uh, in life where that makes sense, maybe from like a skill acquisition or whatever. But I, I don't think um, it actually matters that much when it comes to hypertrophy. And I think, you know, as bodybuilders throughout the years have moved in between frequencies, you know, as high as, uh, you know, four or five times a week to one time a week, I don't think it really made any difference, particularly for enhanced individuals like maybe there's something there in terms of you know whether it be sort of like the protein synthetic response and maybe how that's you know um you know can potentially be influenced by things like aging um maybe you know those are cases where you know in, in natural individuals you want to sort of um be able to stimulate that response a little bit more frequently and maybe just practically, you know, laying things out multiple times a week is, is a little more important. But first of all, I don't think it's that important. Like, I don't think it's a primary driver. 
like anything else, moving, you know, between not doing anything at all and doing it once is huge. Moving from once to twice, you know, is a little bit better. But then, you know, it has sort of the, a curve that just flattens out over time. And what we see in the research with, you know, natural inter- individuals under the conditions that they're measured is that moving from once a week to twice a week may have some benefit. Um, but I don't think it's kind of like a, a make or break thing. I think practically most people end up training, you know, each muscle group with that sort of frequency anyway. Um and for individuals who you know are enhanced it it probably doesn't matter at all yeah and i think that to uh, one of the things that i wanted to to mention um you you were talking about it earlier was this concept of um rate limiters and specifically how in certain instances if you do see decreased output it may be because of something like a cardiovascular limiter that is something that in the context, let's say, of like personal training may actually be the reason that you're doing the superset is that you want some, you want someone to uh, to arrive at some degree of fatigue cardiovascularly, but also from, a, you know, at a, mo- at a local muscular level, you know, so maybe you superset pendulum squat with like chest press and your aim is to actually get their heart rate up and keep their heart rate up. Um, you know, for, for the majority of the workout, that could be an instance where, you know, in terms of hypertrophy outcome, it may be less advantageous, but in terms of uh, something that, you know, um, is, is in its nature, a different goal like that, that could be a use case where the trade-off in one instance that we're looking at as, as a net negative actually becomes, you know, more aligned with, with what, um, someone is trying to do. Not that that would be something that's hyper relevant to someone who's, you know, a high level bodybuilder or something like that. Um, but it is just a potential use case for any personal trainers, maybe who are listening and, um, are thinking about application to their, you know, gen pomp, um, clientele. The, uh, one of the things that we, so we haven't talked about yet is just um, so use cases for supersets then that are same set um, or same muscle group supersets, uh, but not just in relationship to, you know, the normal exercise order of like doing the pec fly first and then, you know, doing four sets of the pec fly and then, you know, resting adequately and then going over to the, to this chest press, but more something like, all right, we're going directly from you know, leg extension into hack squat, or we're going directly from, you know, preacher curl into face away curl or something like that. Um, can you currently see use case for that kind of thing in, uh, in, in your own training and, um, just more generally in terms of, uh, application of whatever you think that use case is for bodybuilders in general, who are looking to, you know, maximize hypertrophy. Can you see it sort of fitting in to a program anywhere? I don't personally have anything like that right now in my program that comes to mind. Um, Again, I think, you know, just the order of exercises, um, you know, can have the same sort of influence, um, at least in terms of the things that that we've discussed, like the goal of, um, you know, just, creating a bias and a limiter in in one particular muscle. Um, I will sometimes use it with clients. Like I can think of examples where, you know, your point about like almost no one actually has the goal of being like the best bodybuilder they can be, even if it's kind of the stated goal Um, I just think is so relevant. And I think that the thing people actually need to plan for most of the time is like, what do they actually enjoy and what's going to allow them, you know, to do this thing with the highest amount of like frequency and longevity Mm -hmm. over time. Um, So I can think of, you know, a couple examples where I'll have it in clients programs where I just want to maximally reduce load uh on a given movement but i still want it to be a movement that they have in their program sort of like a movement pattern that they can maintain um it's something that they're like you know highly competent in and i do and there's someone oftentimes who just can't really push themselves to a high degree of local fatigue 
and I want them to have that somewhere in their program. So for example, like, let's say that I wanted to reduce the load on like a hip hinging movement, for example, to sort of like spare the spine. Um, I might do like a, uh, a leg curl exercise right into a hip hinge. And, you know, the leg curl is not going to be something generally that's very systemically fatiguing. So it shouldn't really throw off, you know, their execution when it comes to say the RDL, if they're competent. Um, but by doing that first, it may limit the output on the RDL, but after they get done with the RDL, like they still kind of have that systemic fatigue component where, you know, if it's a gen pop person and they're not, you know, going to do any cardio outside, um, you know, they're not really, um, you know, participating in any other sports or anything that, you know, I want to keep the, the pace of the workout relatively fast. I still want to have them do sort of multi-joint lifts that drive some degree of systemic fatigue, but also, you know, with orthopedic health, as we've discussed, oftentimes being the primary long-term limiter, I want to make sure that, you know, I pay respect to that. And uh, depending on, say, the frequency that I'm doing for a given movement or prior injuries, I may want to just really pay attention to, you know, reducing load on a given movement. So there's some like really specific examples where it's like, yeah, I'm willing to, um, you know, to make those accommodations, but it's not something that I'm doing, you know, very frequently. Like I've certainly heard arguments where they're just like these theoretical concepts like if we do you know the short exercise short biased exercise before the long bias the long bias before the short bias um it's just something that i think at this point is, is very theoretical sometimes you will see it play out orthopedically like we we've discussed the concept of like again just exercise order whether that exercise order be immediately going you know doing, you know, some reps short and then immediately going long or just doing, you know, an entire exercise that's biased short and then doing the entire exercise that's biased long. We've talked about that concept in terms of like how it feels orthopedically and that potentially being good long-term. Um, but, you know, as far as differentiating the stimulus at sort of a biochemical level, um, I don't, you know, really think we have enough evidence to, to stand behind it strongly and say that like, uh, people need to make sure that they're getting this at some point in their program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, in terms of uh, actual application and outcomes, you know, you don't, you don't really like, I, we started this conversation off with me just contextualizing that, like, we're kind of going through this social media trend of people poo pooing, you know, the supersets and, specifically under the superset category the supersets that are same set muscle group like people will make very strong claims about how like it's garbage it's trash it's not gonna work it's it will fatigue cns and therefore you know no outcome and, and i just i don't know even if you imagine like the worst case scenario where it's like you're doing a super heavy lengthened exercise into basically the same exact thing immediately after like horizontal row into horizontal row into horizontal row and they're all like you know maybe slightly different variations and profiles and whatnot i think if you're like if you're putting in a ton of effort into all those things and you are doing enough volume of that effort i would just find it very hard to believe that like you would not see a desirable outcome from that like you know what i mean i'm not i'm not sitting here saying that like it would be w optimal uh, or it, it would be more robust than the alternative but i do think that a lot of times people will use this information and sort of weaponize it as a strategy to um to get views and to get engagement and to get people angry about it because you know and it's somewhat proof in the pudding where you see all these people coming out in the comment section. They're like, dude, I've been doing like same muscle group supersets for 10 years and like I'm in great shape. I've grown a ton, you know, so clearly like these are the kinds of things, as we've mentioned, are not that are not sort of make it or break it, um, I think, maybe apart from a few extreme cases. And I think that's important to mention uh, as just like, a, hey, you know, Ethan may not 
use this strategy across all of his exercises or even any of his exercises right now, but there is still a use case. And as we were talking about earlier, if it is something that gets you excited to train and you like the feeling of it, and uh, it's something that, you know, you look forward to and that gets you excited about the gym, then like, to me, that's a win in and of itself in many ways. And um, I think that, I think that it takes, I think it takes a degree of experience to be able to prioritize that over something that may in theory lend to, you know, a more robust immediate outcome. I've, I've done it before. Like I've, I've used that as like a primary strategy in the past where, for example, like maybe I'm in a, like a maintenance phase, um, just trying to, you know, basically maintain muscle. And um, I just want to have like the least amount of time in the gym, kind of get out, get in, get out, you know, focus on the rest of life. Um, and also I've been training, let's, you know, say like pretty heavy for a while. I want to, you know, bring a little bit of load off the joints and I just want to do something that again, it's going to be like fun and interesting. Yeah. I've absolutely done phases in the past that feature, you know, you know, maybe I'm transitioning, you know, more and more in that direction of local fatigue where it's like, I went from a phase where I was at the time, maybe, you know, resting three minutes in between sets and working up to the point where, you know, I was, you know, going to failure and I couldn't progress anymore and, you know, the loads, regardless of the rep range, you know, we're at a point of, of failure and uh, starting to, you know, accumulate wear and tear joint wise. And then, you know, I go into another phase where it's like, okay, now I'm in the gym for, you know, let's say 60% of the time, maybe I've reduced sets overall, maybe I realized that like, I don't need to sort of maximize the stimulus at this point, let me just go in, uh, not even have to worry necessarily about how much load I was using for how many reps previously, because now I have no real like reference point to go off of. It's like, just because, you know, you were doing rows, you know, with 200 pounds for 10 in the last phase. And now you're doing, you know, let's say like pullovers into rows or whatever the hell, like you have no idea how much you can do on that row. I think that's a valuable concept when you're switching phases to not know how much weight you're supposed to use uh -huh. because it actually oftentimes leads you to cleaning up your execution when you're not coming in with that bias as you know, per what I've said before about not necessarily using the log book to determine exactly how much to do if you're going to go to failure. So sometimes those resets in between phases where you're doing something novel, it automatically, whether you're changing the exercise, you're changing the rep range, you're supersetting, you're rest pausing, whatever you're doing that's novel, you all of a sudden lose context. And you're in a place where there is a bit of like learning taking place, whether it's learning in terms of like, how to sort of uh, move through the workout, how to execute, you know, a different exercise, how to pick the load, how to deal with, you know, uh, the, this localized fatigue from the, you know, um, same muscle group supersets all these things you go through this initial phase of learning and when you're switching between blocks a lot of times it's useful to do something novel because it ends up just reducing fatigue as you go through this initial learning phase um so i've never seen anything in terms of my measurements that would lead me to believe when i went into those phases that you know they weren't achieving uh, that goal um, and I think I could absolutely design a program that was all, you know, same muscle group supersets that would be plenty effective. Like well, a, a lot of people aren't like actually counting up the amount of sets they're doing anyway. They're just training for a specified amount of time and specified feeling. So it's like, if anything, I think just resting less and doing same muscle group supersets would just lead people to do more work in the mm -hmm. gym. They'd probably end up getting better result mm -hmm. you know depending on how much they're measuring because is the reality that like the person that's doing same muscle group supersets like if they were going to do you know you know a, a horizontal press an incline press and a fly is the reality now that like they're just supersetting you know the fly and horizontal press and doing the incline press or is the reality that they're probably doing the same amount of like stations that they were doing before and now they're just doing more sets overall. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. That is what's actually happening. 
is that they end up just doing more. So even if it turns out that they were a little bit worse, like you just end up being in the gym for a pretty similar amount of time. You probably end up doing more sets overall. And again, I think it's just really important to contextualize that like fatigue is accumulating no matter what, just because you're not doing that set right afterwards, uh, just because it's a different exercise doesn't mean that when you go to your second set, you didn't accumulate fatigue. It's all just time course, right? Mm -hmm. so you might be resting three minutes, but you still have the fatigue for you still would have been better if you didn't do the set before it. You know, you, the order of your exercise is still going to drive the fatigue on the next set. So regardless of how you play it out, like you, I don't think a lot of people are making the argument that you just come in and do one set for one muscle group, you know, leave, come back, you know, a couple hours later and do another set for another muscle group. Like it is just a byproduct that cannot be separated from the result. So those same people are probably doing like drop sets and shit like that. Um, you know, maybe not like, I, I didn't know that it was a thing that people are saying like supersets are bad. So I don't really know what these people are doing, but <laughs> it, it's, it's, I just think that like, it's not appreciating the, the general concept that fatigue is a natural byproduct uh, that we're going to get out of the stimulus and how you arrange it is I, I don't think the primary driving factor again assuming that the limiter is what you want it to be yeah so to kind of wrap up and to summarize in an oversimplified way if you're interested and potentially excited about supersets whether it be opposing or same set or, or same muscle group supersets uh and it's practical for you and uh it's something that in terms of its practicality can be sustained over time, then you should try it if you're interested and then see how you like it. And um, if you're not interested, then what you're doing in terms of the traditional approach to, you know, sets and resting and you like to stay in one spot and do, you know, one thing repeatedly, that's also fine. Uh, both see, both method, methods seem to work. Each have their potential downsides and upsides, but overall, uh, if you want to try it or, or you're even someone who asks about them in the first place, you should, you know, in, in any case, gain some physical experience with, um, you know, just what it what it's like to do it and just to see if you even like it to begin with. So would you add anything to that, practically speaking? Okay. okay. All right. All right. Fantastic.